Hey guys, good morning. Welcome. We are at our uh, our workstation here, and uh, as we spend our idle hours, maybe down at the uh, watering hole or at the the Penny uh, Kino Bar, things come to mind, and a lot of people that are getting in the business, this hopefully will help them a little bit. Um, let's just kind of call this starting over or starting out in a vending business if you're broke. Well, a lot of people did go broke. Um, I remember 2007, 2008, um, I was still split between Reno and Las Vegas until I sold out in Reno and, and was full-time in Las Vegas as far as my distributorship. Um, there wasn't a lot of locations to be had, um, and of course we all know the economy came back, you know, 2009, I guess 2010. Um, and right now with COVID-19, I have a little bit of problem. Some locations, well, a lot of locations, are closed. However, guys, I also see people in our groups, and they're they're inquiring and talking about these BevMax fours and BevMax sixes and, and merchant snack machines that cost, you know, three to six thousand dollars. You got to do the math. Um, if you're making 25 cents a product, now this is after your insurance, your SIIS, your fuel, um, you know, where you're going to store the stuff, the fact you had to maybe pay somebody to move this equipment. A quarter per product is really a good average. You might make more than that and you might say, well, gee, I sell chips for a dollar. I only pay a quarter for them. That's 75 cents. Well, it's an average. You also buy Snickers for a dollar and sell them for a dollar and a quarter, a dollar and a half, and, and you throw some away because they've become melted. Anyways, what I'm getting at, guys, is there's a lot of small locations out there still. Um, vendors have gone out of business. These places can get by with a Dixie Narco single price soda machine, a Vendo. Um, you can buy these machines for. 100 200 bucks and people say oh i'm not gonna pay 100 for that it's got a bad compressor deck well what if you spent three or four hundred for one that was working and two days later the compressor deck went bad you've got to figure these repairs in you've got to have parts if you were starting over or starting out the machines i would recommend would be single price okay you make all your money on cans Somebody posted in the groups the other day that where can they get 20 ounce Coke if they don't have an account and they spent almost $2 a bottle at Walmart. I think it was $1.94, $1.96. How much are you going to sell them for? You're not in the Marriott downtown San Francisco where they're getting 5 bucks a bottle. That's what you'd have to sell them for realistically. So guys, if you're starting out cans, you're not going to get those huge lunch rooms for international gaming technology and Microsoft and all those kind of places those come down the line uh, as you get a little experience and uh, you get in the business plus you spend some time uh, going after these locations so if you want to get in the business you want to start out start with the small stuff um, AP makes a great snack machine or I should say they made one in in the 80s and it was the uh, the 6600 and the 7600 don't go any older than that. Don't go to the 4000 and 5000 series. Those were a different animal, different electronics. But a 6600 and a 7600 had decent electronics. Now, you can start with machines like that. 100 to 300 bucks, they're all over the place. They made a zillion of them. Um, we bought a ton of them well, when we were operating uh, for our chains of hotels and motels. But anyways, down the line, you know, everybody talks about credit cards. Credit cards are great. They do increase sales. But, you know, in in Javier's tire shop that's got four bays and he's got eight employees and he's got people running in, in and out of there on a Saturday, um, they can get by with dollars and coins. People still do carry cash. But what I was getting at, let's say you start with some decent solid AP, you know, 7600s, which is a five wide, which is huge, guys. I, four wides are awesome. You can always update them. Get that in one kit, um, about 350 bucks. That's for the board, the display, uh, the drop sensors. Uh, of course, you need a, an MDB coin mech. We sell those for about 100 bucks. Get an MEI validator that takes singles. That's a little less than 100 bucks. Um, you don't need to take fives when your top price of an item is a dollar fifty, dollar seventy-five. 
Now, if you're selling $3, $4 items, big energy drinks and all that kind of stuff, yeah, you need to take five. So um, don't let me discount that fact. But ones do add up, and a lot of people still have singles. So, guys, starting out, look at these machines, buy American, stick with the top brands. Coke, Pepsi, 7-Up, RC, all of them. They bought Dixie Narcos and Vendos for one reason. They were dependable. They were bulletproof. Um, the single price machines were great as far as how they operated. They had a coin mecha validator and a single relay, which was called the Vend Relay. Very little to go wrong with these things. Um, yeah, they have motor switches, uh, two, sometimes three across all your motors. Those all have to be up to snuff. The only drawback is a single price machine is sort of like Christmas lights in the old days. If one bulb goes out, the machine goes out. So if you get one jam in the middle somewhere, it defeats the operation of the whole machine. So you need to know a little bit about how they work. But I'm talking about getting into business for less than 5000 bucks and, and, and getting a half a dozen or more locations. You need to know how to work on your own stuff. The Facebook groups that we're involved with, as you know, have a lot of sharp people. Um, post your questions in there. Post a picture of what you're working with, and those guys will be... Uh, be happy to help you. So now in concluding here, I'm going to show you a hack that it was it was brought up to me. I posted in my last video how we unstick a, a bill box. If you get a stacker that's in the out position, this is the uh, this is the main frame of an MEI validator. So what I'm going to do here now, real quick, is one of my good viewers reminded me that instead of a 12 volt power supply, which is great when you're in the shop and you have it on the bench, use a 9 volt battery. So I kind of forgot about this. We used to use three of these together in series to develop 27 volts when we would empty the USI soda machines. Do you remember the slave machines? The machines that were on location that either had the serpentine vend, you couldn't get the cans out. You couldn't reach in and pull them out one at a time. You had to vend them through the bottom. Well, one of my customers, John in Reno, he was quite the uh, he was quite the inventor. He showed up on a job one day and we were moving his equipment. And I said, John, we gotta you know manually vend all these one at a time. He said, Oh no no, I got a tool. Well, he had three of these tie wrapped together in series, 27 volts, and he had the right wire with the right pin that would go right in the harness. So he unclipped the soda slave from the snack machine. And uh, I can't remember if it used a male or female pin, but he had the two wires and he hooked it right up. He had a toggle switch and that column, it just emptied the whole column. We had to sit there at the bottom of the milk crate, of course, but it was fast and it was smart. So let's, let's real quick, let's hook up this nine volt system to the 12 volt motors um, in an MEI and let's see if it works. Okay, let me reposition here a little bit so you can see what we're doing. Alright, I have not tried this prior to this video. I've got some jumpers. Trusty Walmart for their battery selection. And I think if you guys give me enough uh, feedback here on whether you think this would be helpful for you, I may make a kind of a sanitary uh, setup here, okay, to where it's in a little packet, it has a clip, holds the battery or batteries together, and then... Uh, now this is going to be the end here, which we put on our validator. And we know the white wire is the stacker, and that'll be a little bit more visible for you. Okay. I don't think these are... I'm not sure if they're polarized. I shouldn't say that. Okay, let's do this. Let's put one clip on here. And of course these clips are very available at the electronic stores uh, to where they you can uh, 
you know, hook them on with. Yeah, works perfect. Look at that. And of course, we know we're only running it on 5 volts. Pardon me, 9 volts instead of 12. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to hook this other side up to the transport motor. This is what will draw the bill in. When I get these things all put back together, I like to run them and make sure the belts, everything is on true. And you see our drive motor is, is running just like it should. So anyways, guys, if you have any cool hacks you'd like me to kind of show or demonstrate, I would be more than happy to. And uh, I think I may develop that one for the USI trick. A lot of those guys still operate those USI machines. And even if you don't have the slave type sodas, you can open the door, go to the motor, um, clip one on each side. Now this is especially handy if in fact uh, maybe you're pulling a machine out because the board went down or the machine's not in operation so you can't vend those cans. It makes it real heavy to move. So anyways, um, just uh, another hack and uh, I look forward to your ideas and uh, till the next time guys, Doug at Doug's World Tour, Vending and Amusement Channel, out. Hey guys, welcome all. Another uh, another tips and tricks video we think. And the reason I say we think is we got something in the mail today. We know what the box is, but it's not so much the box is maybe what's inside. Okay? <laughs> can, you, can you hear that? I had to open it on camera because I really... I really don't know what we're gonna we're gonna find here. So let's uh, let's open her up, take a peek. We always tell you to send them in if you can't get them back together or otherwise. So maybe. All right, I want to do my best to not give anybody's identity. And by no means are we are we taking humor to this, although... All right, well, we did get a little... We did get a little subway money. Now we actually send that money back to people. When they... All right, so let's see what happens now what rattles <laughs> more all right more subway money but we will return that oh looks like five bucks to the rightful owner and I think what we'll do here guys is we're gonna set up our test jig and uh, we're going to check out this rear load green stripe hopper and uh, I think we'll do it, uh, do the repair together. So anyways guys, stand by while I get set up here. Okay, so we read the packing slip inside and we're not going to test it first because we can sort of assume what maybe is wrong. It said it made a uh, screeching sound so maybe something is stuck. Uh, the gearbox could be dry, the motor could be bad, but if it does that much, we know it at least boots up. And most likely the sensor board is good. Alright, all but two. it. Make sure I'm in uh, camera shot here. Well, 
I can tell this is from a laundry facility. Pretty much from the amount of dust, which is normal. It has really no has no escape. So let's open the gearbox assembly up. Nothing else looks too bad here. No uh, no foreign particles. But if it's making a screeching noise, you know the gearbox is not uh, is not dry either. So I think our next step, guys, is I'm going to uh, take the gearbox, take it apart, clean them up, clean the rest of it, and then uh, probably take a peek into the other side, and then we'll find out. Uh, what that screeching noise is, if it in fact is maybe a bad gear, which is possible. And uh, we'll hook it up to some power and see what happens. So stand by. Alright, so as we progress here, we haven't done any cleaning yet, but I did find out what the problem most likely is. And I want to show you. This is the bottom gear. Now, see that shaft? That hole in the bottom there is twice the size it should be. That should be a tight fit. So this is going to need, and I can feel on my fingers how sharp these teeth are, and that's just a sign of wear. Um, we will closely inspect these, but these feel real. Oh, I see. This is broken here. You see on the top there, might be hard to see, but the edges of all those teeth are broken off. So this is definitely going to need a gear set. So we will uh, we will do our best. We'll get cleaned up. We'll get a uh, a fresh gear set out and uh, put her back together. Stand by. Okay, guys, all cleaned up. We have our uh, new gear set remanufactured gear set. They're not new, but they're very low miles. So I want to show you what we have, what we're working on here as far as new parts. And I have a little bit of a funny story here regarding the chain, the belt. I call it a chain. It's called a belt. Anyways, so I had to get our hot glue gun out, our trusty little $10 Chinese hot glue gun, which I'm going to put aside here for a few minutes. And we had to do some repair work on the back side of the connector. This had a pin, I think it was the, no, it was the other side. It was, as you're looking at it by my thumb, the top right pin had sort of smashed through the back. The only way to get those back in and to hold, because you can't crimp them, is straighten them and then run a bead of hot glue around them. And using glue may sound a little cheesy, but believe me, I've done a lot of these. It's the only ones that, uh, that hold. So here was the screeching noise. Can you see this round mark there? That's where the lower gear was hitting the case. So what we're going to do here is we are going to put this back together, put our new gear set in there, seal it up, and then put our belt, seal up our gearbox, I should say, and put our belt in there. We use uh, synthetic grease. You don't want to get overly aggressive with this. Here is the biggest gear, which is lowest gear or should I say the first gear that goes in just spread it around you can use a popsicle stick or a screwdriver whatever you like and uh, let me see if I get it just a little closer here all right then our two matching gears are the same size and they go next okay all these face in the upward position, and by that I mean this part of the gear. 
that always goes up okay those two in put a little more grease that's going to go between them that they ride on we going to do this a little quicker so you're not bored with watching me grease these gears. And it will, it will spread for you. You don't have to worry about getting too crazy. And then last but not least, the flat gear. This was the one that was really sharp as far as the old ones go. And when they get sharp, it just means there's a lot of wear and it will soon break a tooth off. Unfortunately, we also had to change the drive gear. The other one, uh, I'll show you here in a minute. A little bit on the shaft, a little bit on the gear. Because the other one was extremely chewed up. In other words, around here, we stuck a probe through there, and we could just feel it was gravelly. Very rough. So, anyways, you have it this far. You put your, your cover back on, just like that. Some of these are, some of these screws they give you here are stainless, so it's a little bit a challenge to maybe get the inner screw in there. What I normally do is I grab a pair of uh, needle nose because I don't have one of those Phillips that has the little clips on them. So I do this and hopefully you don't drop it the first time. And that, once you've done a few, it's relatively simple. Now I'm going to put the the chain together. Now this is a little bit of a funny story. Um, I had a guy on one of the groups and he showed a picture of a brand new chain assembly that he got from the factory. And his caption was as he was looking at 16 of these, where are my directions? They could have at least sent some directions. Anyways, um, they clip together, guys. It's a it's a 30 second task. There are really no directions. What I do normally do is I work in groups of four. That way I know that I've got all 16 of them. Do this. Inside is how they go. The last one clips, just like that. Now, the shark's teeth, as I call them, they go down in your hopper. Okay? Turn it around this way. This is the tricky part. This is the part most people get wrong. They put the cover on. The chain is in a jam because one of these little teeth is not in the track. Now the way to tell if they're in the track is you spin it, okay? Now I did that pretty quickly. I'm going to grab a new idler gear before. Whoops. <laughs> New idler gear. I like to slip these in last because we know that my chain has already spun smoothly. A little bit of finesse goes right down. Um, this was a rear load, so that means the plug goes towards the chute. Okay. Now, and if you ever forget, you can always see where the 
where the window is for the connector. So what we're going to do now, we still have not opened the back side up, which we're going to do last. Okay, so you slip that in there like that, and I always stress the fact that you don't have to put any pressure, guys. In other words, sometimes these cases can have a little bit of a twist to them. That's okay, but only only an eighth of an inch. Okay, you should be able to hold it like that. It should be sealed all the way around. Um, I will put the thing back together now. You have nine screws. And I go around them like you would put a, uh, a tire on your car. You start in the, maybe the middle. I get my small driver out because got to remember guys we're only going in plastic so then I go to a corner and I can feel if this thing moves or if it goes pop the last thing you really want to do is take this back apart thing with the plug-in you can inspect this has to sit perfectly flush this guy had used some kind of a white grease in there for the plug-in which grease is fine but we use the clear synthetic and then once I get that white grease in there it's pretty hard to get out so anyways we are going to now whoops I gotta have a screw here oh I didn't tighten the middle one no Whoops, no, I left this one out, see? All right, what we need to do now, we're going to take the back half off, and then I'll clean that up off camera. We have our two screws here. Um, these are 5 16 A lot of times it's tiny little nuts, and they're 5 millimeters. And that's the only reason I ever use my 5 millimeter socket and I mean the only time and I take those off and good rule of thumb is take the wires off sometimes these nuts the second set of nuts in other words I've already taken the first one off okay these hold your sold out plates okay now that was a little bit loose just about an eighth of a turn just give them a little snug, that way you know that when you put it back together, everything is right. Alright, now, get out my trusty Ryobi. These, you can't pull the screws out because they're recessed so far, so I like to shake them out, get a couple at a time, that way you don't lose them. Same with the center one. Alright, that's three. We got two more. And we'll get these out without dumping them on the floor. Alright. So, I'm going to bring the camera around the front side here so you can get a little bit of a better look. I normally do is with it on the bench is I pull it I pull this the sides apart now okay like so wires go through the bottom here anyway so what we're gonna do now see this here is a little bit fuzzy once again it was a laundromat okay now I'm glad I showed you this on camera because watch here the part that gets the biggest jam is right here that's your sensor board 
that's your prism or your optics now look in here let me do it down here so I can save this big clump of lint okay this is what came out of there now by no means is it still clean but before we could even get the cleaner and the q-tip in there we had to take all that fuzz out so now what we're going to do is we're going to take this outside going to give it a good brushing and then we're going to clean get as much of this black residue off our chemical of choice is goo gone because it doesn't hurt the plastic it'll take a lot of this black gunk off now that may not seem like a big deal because you don't see it however if you don't clean the insides and it's nice and slick it will cause the coins to bridge you walk up your changers out of order but it looks like the hoppers full you bang on the side and it goes down because there was a bridge in there so by cleaning the insides of this it's going to greatly alleviate that problem so all right off camera i'm going to get us cleaned up we're going to put it back together and we're going to test it so stand by okay we are close to being done here not completely we have to put our back half on and in the back half there is the shaker assembly um, agitator I think they call it and the first time you put this in it's not supposed to be hard it might be a little tricky you have to get this little tab in that little window which I know is kind of hard to see with everything being completely black so I kind of have a feel for where it goes I like to line up the little shaft in a flat position because you have to connect that with the drive shaft that sticks through here okay now the next part of this even trickier these wires I've got to go back through the slot poke them in there as far as you can okay then what you can do is pull them through and if you can't reach them maybe you have one of the early hoppers that has kind of short wires this is your best friend with the hook on the end to grab them we didn't need to this time because we got a little bit lucky so we pull the wires through we make sure once again that everything is uh, square and fitting correctly there's not a big gap somewhere and when we put the screws in just let it connect and I back off until I have at least gone across I know it is fit squarely I didn't hear a clunk. Alright, now what we do we put our, our two wires back on our two studs, like so. Kind of tuck those guys in there so they don't get in the way. And just snug these you don't have to whoops you say you don't have to uh, get real aggressive with it I like to keep the wire from kind of wrapping around and resting on the side of the case and you may have to hold it with a screwdriver like so okay now for our finger here to hold that wire just a light snug somewhere in the process we lost the center screw here on the bench but we will find that one so guys we are as close to being ready to hook this up to our uh, our tester now here's what we want to do first is 
The pins, this is a male pin plate, i.e. female pins on the uh, hopper, and they go both ways. They change them. We want to put a very small amount of our grease of choice on the pins. Now this is, you don't put much, okay? Because it's kind of like the old light bulb theory. Your dad used to put grease on them that way when he went to change that bulb in five years. He wouldn't be holding the bulb in his hand and the brass part, the socket, the base would still be in it. So here's what I do, first of all, is I want to be able to see the pins, okay? Now this one fit nicely. However, sometimes you have to make a little adjustment here, okay? Like this one. We may have a pin that is just a little high. No, they fit pretty nice. But with that grease in there, it really helps. So, all right, guys, what we're going to do now is I'm going to set up my test jig and uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed and uh, show you that the final product is working and ready to send back to the customer. So, stand by. Okay, our final assembly. We have it hooked up. I'm going to try this live. We have our hopper sold out light our MDB cable that goes to our validator. We just pulled any old 24 volt um, MEI off the shelf. This is just a ones and fives unit, but let's see if it comes up and the sold out light goes out. So far so good. Now I don't have this full and I will test it. We run them through twice a full hopper for the customers just now to save time have four coins in my hand. We'll use nickels because the quarters disappear around my shop. So we will do this. Start with those. And one, two, three, four. So other than final testing, this was an unusual one. We did use a lot of parts. Um, the thing that was a little suspect to me was these gears had grease on them. In other words, a lot of times I open these up and they're completely dry. I think what happened is maybe somebody um, to try and save this or resurrect it um, put grease on the gears and kind of didn't either didn't notice the broken teeth or they probably didn't have a gear set laying around you know their shop or their location. So we did go through a lot of parts in this one which is uncommon so we try and keep that to a minimum. So guys uh, let me think I showed you my chemicals of choice. I didn't show you my grease of choice. This is my cleaner, just for general stuff. And I like it because it sticks. It's kind of a foam um, as far as my Gojo bottle or my Goo Gone bottle. This will not harm the plastic. I recommend it. I do not recommend you using the other graffiti removers because they hurt the plastic. And this is the synthetic grease I use. I think I buy this or found it on Amazon. It's like a bicycle grease. It's clear. It doesn't make quite as much of a mess. And they do say it lasts longer. So, guys, there you go. You want to stock your workbench with some good cleaners. And, uh, like I said, other than final testing, we will run this through two full sets of coins, 2,000 coins twice, put it in the dump mode, make sure it's good, and we will get it back to the customer so they are back up and running. So guys, for now, Doug at Doug's World Tour, we appreciate your subscription. It helps our small channel, and uh, we want to keep these videos free. For now, out.